Well, hello, this is Vincent Green, and we're going to continue our 52 weeks of reading through the Bible. And today we're going to finish up the book of Judges. We're going to read Judges chapters 18 all the way to the end, chapter 21. So four chapters today. And we're in week number 12, day number four of our 52 weeks of reading through the Bible. Chapter 18. Oh, and by the way, this these four chapters show us the corruption of society because of sin. Chapter 18. Now in those days, Israel had no king. And the tribe of Dan was trying to find a place where they could settle. For they had not yet moved into the land assigned to them when the land was divided among the tribes of Israel. So the men of Dan chose from their clans five capable warriors from the towns of Zorah and Eshtaol to scout out a land for them to settle in. When these warriors arrived in the hill country of Ephraim, they came to Micah's house and spent the night there. Remember Micah from our previous reading? While at Micah's house, they recognized the young Levite's accent. So they went over and asked him, Who brought you here, and what are you doing in this place? Why are you here? He told them about his agreement with Micah, and that he had been hired as Micah's personal priest. Then they asked, or then they said, Ask God whether or not our journey will be successful. Go in peace, the priest replied, for the Lord is watching over your journey. So the five men went on to the town of Laish, where they noticed the people living carefree lives, like the Sidonians. They were peaceful and secure. The people were also wealthy because their land was very fertile. And they lived a great distance from Sidon and had no allies nearby. When the men returned to Zorah and Eshtal, their relatives asked them, What did you find? The men replied, Come on, let's attack them. We have seen the land and it is very good. What are you waiting for? Don't hesitate to go and take possession of it. When you get there, you will find the people living carefree lives. God has given us a spacious and fertile land, lacking in nothing. So 600 men from the tribe of Dan, armed with weapons of war, set out for Zorah and Eshtaol. They camped at a place west of kiriath Jerem in Judah, which is called Mahanedan to this day. Then they went on from there into the hill country of Ephraim and came to the house of Micah. The five men who had scouted out the land around Laish explained to the others, these buildings contain a sacred ephod, as well as some household idols, a carved image, and a cast idol. What do you think you should do? Then the five men turned off the road and went over to Micah's house, where the young Levite lived, and greeted him kindly. As the six hundred armed warriors from the tribe of Dan stood at the entrance of the gate, the five scouts entered the shrine and removed the carved image, the sacred ephod, the household idols, and the cast idol. Meanwhile, the priest was standing at the gate with the 600 armed warriors. When the priest saw the men carrying all the sacred objects out of Micah's shrine, he said, What are you doing? Be quiet and come with us, they said. Be a father and priest to all of us. Isn't it better to be a priest for an entire tribe and clan of Israel than for the household of just one man? Well, the young priest, he was quite happy to go with them. You see, he wasn't that loyal to Micah, was he? So he took along the sacred ephod, the household idols, and the carved image. They turned and started on their way again, placing their children, livestock, and possessions in front of them. While the people from the tribe of Dan were quite a distance from Micah's house, The people who lived near Micah came chasing after them. They were shouting as they caught up with them. The men of Dan turned around and said to Micah, What's the matter? Why have you called 
these men together and chase after us like this. What do you mean? What's the matter? Micah replied. You have taken away all the gods I have made, and my priest and I have nothing left. The men of Dan said, Watch what you say. There are some short-tempered men around here who might get angry and kill you and your family. So the men of Dan continued on their way. When Micah saw that there were too many of them for him to attack, he turned around and went home. Then, with Micah's idols and his priest, the men of Dan came to the town of Laish, whose people were peaceful and secure. They attacked with swords and burned the town to the ground. There was no one to rescue the people, for they lived a great distance from Sidon and had no allies nearby. This happened in the valley near Beth Rehub. Then the people of the tribe of Dan rebuilt the town and lived there. They renamed the town Dan after their ancestor, Israel's son, but it had originally been called Laish. Then they set up the carved image and they appointed Jonathan, son of Gershom, son of Moses, as their priest. This family continued as priests for the tribe of Dan until the exile. So Micah's carved image was worshipped by the tribe of Dan as long as the tabernacle of God remained at Shiloh. So you say, what's going on here? You see, these, the corruption is in what they do with those carved images. They are making God into an image. And while the tabernacle remained at Shiloh, they're going to have their own worship, and they're going to do it their own way. And you can see the problems that it creates. Everyone was so wanting the, the idols. And when the idols were taken away, they didn't like that. And the priest was willing to go wherever. This is the tragedy of sin. It's a picture of sin. A picture of how sin corrupts. Chapter 19. Now in those days Israel had no king. There was a man from the tribe of Levi, living in a remote area of the hill country of Ephraim. One day he brought home a woman from Bethlehem in Judah to be his concubine. She became angry with him and returned to her father's home in Bethlehem. After about four months, her husband set out for Bethlehem to speak personally to her and persuade her to come back. He took with him a servant and a pair of donkeys. When he arrived at her father's house, her father saw him and welcomed him. Her father urged him to stay a while, so he stayed three days, eating and drinking and sleeping there. On the fourth day, the man was up early, ready to leave, but the woman's father said to his son-in-law, Have something to eat before you go. So the two men sat down together and had something to eat and drink. Then the woman's, the woman's father said, Please stay another night and enjoy yourself. Well, the man got up to leave, but his father-in-law kept urging him to stay, so he finally gave in and stayed the night. On the morning of the fifth day, he was up early again, ready to leave. And again, the woman's father said, Have something to eat, then you can leave later this afternoon. So they had another day of feasting. Later, as the man and his concubine and servant were preparing to leave, his father-in-law said, Look, it's almost evening. Stay the night and enjoy yourself. <clears throat> Tomorrow you can get up early and be on your way. But this time the man was determined to leave, so he took his two saddled donkeys, his concubine, and headed into the direction of Jebus, that is, Jerusalem. It was late in the day when they neared Jebus. And the man's servant said to him, Let's stop at this Jebusite town and spend the night there. No, his master said, we can't stay in this foreign town where there are no Israelites. Instead, we will go to Gibeah. Come on, let's try to get as far as Gibeah or Ramah. And we'll spend the night in one of those towns. So they went on. The sun was setting as they came to Gibeah, a town in the land of Benjamin. So they stopped there to spend the night. They rested in the town square, but no one took them in for the night. 
That evening, an old man came home from his work in the fields. He was from the hill country of Ephraim, but he was living in Gibeah, where the people were from the tribe of Benjamin. When he saw the travelers sitting in the town square, he asked them where they were from and where they were going. We have been in Bethlehem in Judea, the man replied. We are on our way to a remote area in the hill country of Ephraim, which is my home. I traveled to Bethlehem, and now I'm returning home. But no one has taken us in for the night, even though we have everything we need. We have straw and feed for our donkeys and plenty of bread and wine for ourselves. You are welcome to stay with me, the old man said. I will give you anything you might need, but whatever you do, don't spend the night in the square. So he took them home with him and fed the donkeys. After they washed their feet, they ate and drank together. While they were enjoying themselves, a crowd of troublemakers from the town surrounded the house. They began beating at the door and shouting to the old man, Bring out the man who is staying with you so we can have sex with him. Does this sound like Sodom and Gomorrah? Remember the story there? The old man stepped outside to talk to them. No, my brothers, don't do such an evil thing. For this man is a guest in my house, and such a thing would be shameful. Here, take my virgin daughter and this man's concubine. I will bring them out to you, and you can abuse them and do whatever you like. But don't do such a shameful thing to this man. But they wouldn't listen to him. So the Levite took hold of his concubine and pushed her out the door. The men of the town abused her all night, taking turns raping her until morning. Finally, at dawn, they let her go. At daybreak, the woman returned to the house where her husband was staying. She collapsed at the door of the house and lay there until it was light. When her husband opened the door to leave, there lay his concubine with her hands on the threshold. He said, get up, let's go, but there was no answer. So he put her don body on his donkey and took her home. When he got home, he took a knife and cut his concubine's body into twelve pieces. Then he sent one piece to each tribe throughout all the territory of Israel. Everyone who saw it said, Such a horrible crime has not been committed in all the time since Israel left Egypt. Think about it. What are we going to do? Who's going to speak up? Chapter 20 Then all the Israelites were united as one man, from Dan in the north to Beersheba in the south, including those from across the Jordan in the land of Gilead. The entire community assembled in the presence of the Lord at Mizpah, the leaders of all the people and all the tribes of Israel, 400,000 warriors armed with swords, Swords took their positions in the assembly of the people of God. Word even soon reached the land of Benjamin that the other tribes have, had gone up to Mizpah. The Israelites then asked how this terrible crime had happened. The Levite, the husband of the woman who had been murdered, said, My concubine and I came to spend the night in Gibeah, a town that belongs to the people of Benjamin. That night, some of the leading citizens of Gibeah surrounded the house, planning to kill me, and they raped my concubine until she was dead. So I cut her body into twelve pieces and sent the pieces throughout the territory assigned to Israel, for these men have committed a terrible and shameful crime. Now then, all of you, the entire community of Israel, must decide here and now what should be done about this. And all the people rose to their feet in unison and declared, None of us will return home. No, not even, not even one of us. Instead, this is what we will do to Gibeah. We will draw lots to decide who will attack it. One-tenth of the men from each tribe will be chosen to supply the warriors with, with food, and the rest of us will take revenge on Gibeah a Benjamin for this shameful thing they have done in Israel. So all the Israelites were completely uni united, and they gathered together to attack the town. The Israelites sent, sent messengers to the tribe of Benjamin, saying, What a terrible thing has been done among you. Get, give up those evil men, those troublemakers from Gibeah, 
so we can execute them and purge Israel of this evil. But the people of Benjamin would not listen. Instead, they came from their towns and gathered at Gibeah to fight the Israelites. In all, 26,000 of their warriors, armed with swords, arrived in Gibeah to join the 700 elite troops who lived there. Among Benjamin's elite troops, 700 were left-handed, and each of them could sling a rock and hit a target with a hair's breadth without missing. Israel had 400,000 experienced soldiers armed with swords, not counting Benjamin's warriors. Before the battle, the Israelites went to Bethel and asked God, which tribe should go first to attack the people of Benjamin? The Lord answered, Judah is to go first. So the Israelites left early in the next morning and camped near Gibeah. Then they advanced toward Gibeah to attack the men of Benjamin. Benjamin's warriors, who were defending the town, came out and killed 22,000 Israelites on the battlefield that day. But the Israelites encouraged each other and took their positions again at the same place they had fought the previous day, for they had gone up to Bethel and wept in the presence of the Lord until evening. They had asked the Lord, Should we fight against our relatives from Benjamin again? And the Lord had said, Go out and fight against them. So the next day they went out again to fight against the men of Benjamin. But the men of Benjamin killed another 18,000 Israelites, all of whom were experienced with the sword. Then all the Israelites went up to Bethel and wept in the presence of the Lord and fasted until evening. They also brought burnt offerings and peace offerings to the Lord. The Israelites went up seeking direction from the Lord. And in those days, the Ark of the Covenant was in Bethel. And Phinehas, son of Eleazar, and grandson of Aaron, was the priest. The Israelites asked the Lord, Should we fight against our relatives from Benjamin again? Or should we stop? The Lord said, Go tomorrow, go, tomorrow I will hand them over to you. Notice it's the third day now. So the Israelites set an ambush all around Gibeah. They went out on the third day and took their positions at the same place as before. When the men of Benjamin came out to attack, they were drawn away from the town. And as they had done before, they began to kill the Israelites. About thirty Israelites died in the open fields and along the roads one leading to Bethel and the other leading back to Gibeah. Then the warriors of Benjamin shouted, We're defeating them as we did before. But the Israelites had planned in advance to run away so that the men of Benjamin would chase them along the roads and be drawn away from the town. When the main group of Israelite warriors reached Baal Tamar, they turned and took up their positions. Meanwhile, the Israelites, hiding in ambush to the west of Gibeah, jumped up to fight. There were 10,000 elite Israelite troops who advanced against Gibeah. The fighting was so heavy that Benjamin didn't realize the impending disaster. So the Lord helped Israel defeat Benjamin, and that day the Israelites killed 25,100 of Benjamin's warriors, all of whom were experienced swordsmen. Then the men of Benjamin saw that they were beaten. The Israelites had retreated from Benjamin's warriors in order to give those hiding in ambush more room to maneuver against Gibeah. Then those who were hiding rushed in from all sides and killed everyone in the town. They had arranged to send up a large cloud of smoke from the town as a signal. When the Israelites saw the smoke, they turned and attacked Benjamin's warriors. By that time, Benjamin's warriors had killed about 30 Israelites, and they shouted, We're defeating them as we did in the first battle. When the warriors of Benjamin looked behind them and saw the smoke rising into the sky from every part of the town, the men of Israel turned and attacked. At this point, the men of Benjamin became terrified because they realized disaster was close at hand. So they turned around and fled before the Israelites toward the wilderness. But they couldn't escape the battle, and the people who came out of the nearby towns were killed. The Israelites surrounded the men of Benjamin and chased them relentlessly, finally overtaking them east of Gibeah. That day, 18,000 of Benjamin's strongest warriors died in battle. The survivors fled into the wilderness towards the rock of Remnon. But Israel killed 5,000 of them along the road. They continued the chase until they had killed another 2,000 near Gidom. So that day, the tribe of Benjamin lost 25,000 strong warriors armed with swords leaving only 600 men who escaped to the rock of Rimmon.
Rimon, where they lived for four months. And the Israelites returned and slaughtered every living thing in all the towns, the people, the livestock, and everything they found. They also burned down all the towns they came to. God did not wipe out this town like he did Sodom and Gomorrah, but he wiped it out still. It shows you the level of corruption where sin can go and what it causes, especially the sin of homosexuality. It's an abomination in the eyes of God. It is unnatural. It is not how God has created us to be. And it shows you the level of the depravity of sin. And this shows you how God feels about it. Chapter 21. The Israelites had vowed at Mizpah, we will never give our daughters in marriage to a man from the tribe of Benjamin. Now the people went to Bethel and sat in the presence of God until evening, weeping loudly and bitterly. O Lord, God of Israel, they cried out. Why has this happened in Israel? Now one of our tribes is missing from Israel. Early the next morning, the people built an altar and presented their burnt offerings and peace offerings on it. Then they said, Who among the tribes of Israel did not join us at Mizpah when we held our assembly in the presence of the Lord? At that time they had taken a solemn oath in the Lord's presence, vowing that anyone who refused to come would be put to death. The Israelites felt sorry for their brother Benjamin and said, Today one of the tribes of Israel has been cut off. How can we find wives for the few who remain? since we have sworn that by the Lord not to give them our daughters in marriage. So they asked, Who among the tribes of Israel did not join us at Mizpah when we assembled in the presence of the Lord? And they discovered that no one from Jabesh Gilead had attended the assembly. For after they counted all the people, no one from Jabesh Gilead was present. So the assembly sent 12,000 of their best warriors to Jabez Gilead with orders to kill everyone there, including women and children. This is what you are to do, they said. Completely destroy all the males and every woman who is not a virgin. Among the residents of Jabez Gilead, they found 400 young virgins who had never slept with a man, and they brought them to the camp at Shiloh in the land of Canaan. The Israelite assembly sent a peace delegation to the remaining people of Benjamin who were living at the Rock of Rimon. Then the men of Benjamin returned to their homes, and the 400 women of Jabesh Gilead who had been spared were given to them as wives, but there was not enough women for all of them. The people felt sorry for Benjamin because the Lord had made this gap among the tribes of Israel. So the elders of assembly asked, How can we find wives for the few who remain, since the women of the tribe of Benjamin are dead? There must be heirs for the survivors so that an entire tribe of Israel is not wiped out. But we cannot give them our daughters in marriage because we have sworn with a solemn oath that anyone who does this will fall under God's curse. Then they thought of the annual festival of the Lord held in Shiloh, south of Lebona, and north of Bethel, along the east side of the road that goes from Bethel to Shechem. They told the men of Benjamin, who still needed wives, Go! and hide in the vineyards. When you see the young women of Shiloh come out from their dances, rush out from the vineyards, and each of you can take one of them home to the land of Benjamin to be your wife. And when the fathers and brothers come to us in protest, we will tell them, please be sympathetic. Let them have your daughters, for we didn't find wives for all of them when we destroyed Jabesh Gilead. And you are not guilty of breaking the vow since you did not actually give your daughters to them in marriage. So the men of Benjamin did as they were told. Each man caught one of the women as she danced in the celebration and carried her off to be his wife. They returned to their own land and they rebuilt their towns and lived in them. Then the people of Israel departed by tribes and families and they returned to their own homes. In those days Israel had no king. All the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. 
You see the level of corruption in these last chapters of the book of Judges. It's a poignant story. But you can also see the grace of God as well. And how God is still allowing there to be a remnant for the tribe of Benjamin. So the tribe of Benjamin doesn't fully die off or be cut off from the land of Israel. But you see God's judgment as well. And you see it in a horrific way. You see what how sinful corruption, how it, it the consequences of it. You see all of that here in these four chapters. It's not easy. It's not easy to deal with. But it paints a picture of sin and the reality of it. When you think about the book of Romans and what Paul writes in the book of Romans about sin, he describes it. Here you get a picture of it. You see corruption lived out. And that phrase, they didn't have a king, they didn't have a king. We're anticipating King David. But before that, you have King Saul. God is still sovereignly in charge, even when there's corruption. Let's pray. Dear God, as we read these chapters, we are horrified by the level of sin and level of corruption. But Lord, we're not immune from it. Lord, even gross manifestations of sin are difficult to stomach, difficult to digest. But Lord, we must hear your truth. We must read your word. We must see that you are sovereign in light of all of this. Lord, you are, you are our awesome God and every one of us is accountable to you. There's no mistaking that. And so Lord, I pray that we would always honor you worship you, adore you. Lord, that we would recognize our own sinfulness and come to you knowing that you're the only one that can save us from our sin. You're the only one that can restore our relationship with you. And may you receive all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.